Well, good evening, brethren. Uh, welcome to another study on the book of Revelation. We have completed a study on the seven messages that Christ gave uh, to the Church of God through the ages. We also uh, saw the, that these messages highlight attitudes which may be prevalent amongst us. Christ then, in those seven messages to the churches, gives us warnings to repent and encourages us to overcome till the very end. We also went through a number of major prophetic markers to show us he's in control. We also, in the context, we know that in the end of all these things, God will wipe away every tear and reward ungodly for their deeds and they'll be burnt in the lake of fire and they'll die forever. And because of this, we also addressed and mentioned a number of times that we need to watch and pray that we may be counted worthy to escape and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. We saw, we saw that in Luke 21, 36, and also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Because I quite often refer to Luke 21, verse 36, I want to now quickly just look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. And here we read, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. So one of the important things or some of the important things mentioned here about as being counted worthy to the kingdom of God is the is that our faith needs to grow that is our absolute trust in God that the love of everyone needs to abound towards each other and we need to have patience endurance throughout these persecutions and difficulties that we ought to endure as times are going to get difficult and as we went through these prophetic markers and showing a number of things that are going to happen there's going to be days that are going to be very difficult and we have to endure patiently and have absolute trust as we go through these days ahead so that we may be counted worthy to escape in the days ahead. Now, those that are counted worthy to escape will form part of the church, because not the whole church, but a part of the church, those that are accounted worthy to escape will be protected before the great tribulation, which is the fifth seal. Right. Then, following that, we have the sixth seal. And the sixth seal, and the sixth seal is uh, the signs that God will bring uh, that will warn mankind, the heavenly signs. That God will bring that warn mankind of the great and terrible day of the Lord. That is that last year at the end of the three and a half years of the great tribulation. 
which is the wrath of God. Now, Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, it's important for us to note because yeah, we read uh, at the end of the heavenly signs that people say and in verse 16 and say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? He has a question that we're going to talk about a little bit more today. But one of the things is this day of his wrath, that is the day of the Lord. And when we look at Joel chapter 2 verse 31, and we looked at that before, it shows that the heavenly signs will happen before the terrible day of the Lord. So the heavenly signs are the fifth seal and the terrible day of the Lord is the seventh seal. But, right, but, um, oh, and by the way, uh, the day of the Lord also has an additional meaning. Let's just quickly look at that, which is in Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Because, you know, let's talk, it says, uh, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a one day. So Yah is uh, like a duality of meanings, and many parts in the Bible have dualities of meanings. And so this day of the Lord, this last year, also represents that last millennial period in which God is intervening and uh, bringing peace on earth, but right at the end of it, there will be at the conclusion of that period after probably those that 100 years of the second resurrection, then it, it brings uh, an additional uh, meaning to the day of the Lord because it says the Lord is not slacking concerning his promise. Some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So God is very forgiving. God allows people a lot of time to, to repent, but uh, he wants them all to repent. And so he gives us time. But then we read in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So we can see this dual duality of meaning in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt to fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. So this dual meaning of the day of the Lord is at the end of this whole period in the perspective of looking a day as a thousand years, right at the end of that period, at the end of this period of, of the day of the Lord, of uh, that a day is like a thousand years, there will be a time in which the whole earth will burn. And, and there in verse 11, it gives us a very significant uh, scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what man or persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? The point is, you know, Prophecy uh, has a lot of people very interested. What does this mean? And when is this? And when does this happen? And all the other things. And but yeah, in verse 11 of 2 Peter chapter 3 says, you know, the important thing is that we take prophecy as a warning that there was, there's going to be a judgment. And we better be careful how we conduct ourselves. So that is an important, another layer of meaning to the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is that last year at the end of the Great Tribulation, but the day of the Lord is that also that last millennial part and right towards the end in which 
the whole earth will be burnt up uh, with fervent heat. All right, let's move on. Uh, so that day of the Lord is the seventh seal because the sixth seal is the heavenly sight. And so the day of the Lord is the seventh seal. And as we read in Revelation 6, verse 16 and 17, uh, we saw it's the day of uh, the, the wrath of the Lamb, the, the wrath of God. So before God punishes the earth, he is going to protect those who have repented during the Great Tribulation. So what we see is two, let's call it phases of protection. One before the Great Tribulation, and that is for a part of the church, and another one towards the end of the Great Tribulation, in other words, before the last year, because there will be a number of people that will have repented during the Great Tribulation period. So the seventh seal then happens after those people are sealed. We went through that in previous study. And the seventh seal opens up or consists of seven trumpets. And that period lasts for one year. As we know, the seventh and last trumpet of those seven trumpets symbolizes Christ's coming. And we went through that when we read Revelation 11, 15 through 19. We then went on to chapter 12 of Revelation, in which we looked at a brief history of the church and how it was and how is and how will be persecuted by Satan until Christ comes. So it's, it's a very brief synoptic, um, uh, very encapsulated history of the church, just in one chapter, but particularly of its war with Satan and how Satan tries to destroy the church. Then we went on to chapter 13, which is what we covered in the very last study, and we talked about the two beasts at the end time. One is from Revelation 13, verse 1 to verse 10, which is the one beast that rises up out of the sea. And then the other one is Revelation 13, starting from verse 11 to the end of the chapter, which is the second beast that comes up out of the earth. So those being two beasts, one civil, and another religious, and we also showed how it mostly focuses on the leader of that entity, of that organization or organizations. Well, today <laughs> we're going to look at Revelation 14, but before we do that, we just want to review Revelation 7 because in Revelation 14 talks about 144,000. So we want to look at Revelation 7 because there it's also mentioned the word 144,000. I know and I'm aware that a lot of people think that it is the same 144,000. And the reason why they say that is because it's 144,000. So it's because it's 144,000, must be the same. But that is an assumption, brethren, because if I say the 12, does not mean that I'm always talking about the same 12. For instance, which 12 am I referring to? Could a person be talking about the 12 apostles? Or could be a person be talking about the 12 tribes? Or if the context is talking about the Council of Elders, could he be talking about the 12 members of the Council? You see, we need to consider the context to determine which 12 that person is referring to. Likewise, when we look at Revelation 7, 
or when we look at Revelation 14, we need to look at the context to determine which 144,000 is that context referring to. So let's look at the context of Revelation 7. In Revelation 7, if we go briefly to Revelation 7, you will see that Revelation 7 is exactly after Revelation 6. Oh, well, <laughs> that's a little bit of a joke. But anyway, uh, of course it is. But the point is, at the end of Revelation 6 says, the wrath of the Lamb is coming. Now, the wrath of the Lamb means the time when Christ is going to bring a punishment on the earth. And so before God punishes the earth and the people on the earth, he's going to protect or seal those people that are his servants. You see, that's what we read because before, and, and as we discussed, the, after the sixth seal, which is the concluding section of Revelation 6, verse 12 to 17, is the sixth seal, which is the heavenly signs. We have the seventh seal, which lasts for a year, which is the wrath of the Lamb, which uh, that one year is composed of seven trumpets. And the last trumpet is Christ's coming, right? Symbolizes Christ's coming. And of those seven trumpets, the first four trumpets are what the Bible calls it, uh, things affecting the the earth and uh, affecting um, uh, the uh, the sea and affecting the rivers and affecting the, the 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 sun the moon and the stars so the first four trumpets affect let's call it the environment and those blowings of those trumpets are done by, in a sense, like four winds, you know, obviously it's four, four angels, but it's also referred to, if we read here, in Revelation 7, verse 1 to 3, it says, And after those things I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that wind should not blow on the earth, the sea, or any tree. So those are the winds that, that are going to affect, and those are going to affect the earth and the sea and all those things. And those are the trumpets that are to follow, which are God's punishments on the earth. And then in verse 2 of Revelation 7, it says, Then I saw another angel uh, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels. So which are these four angels? Those are the four first trumpets of the seven trumpets. To whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So these are the first four trumpets in Revelation 8. And in verse 3 says, Do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So God's servants, those people that serve God, need to be sealed first. All right. And then it says, uh, then it talks about a number of those that have been sealed. Uh, and then, in a sense, that's answering the question, at the end of Revelation 6, verse 16, that says, uh, and 17, it says, uh, the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand in the day of his wrath? It's those that are sealed. Now, those that are sealed, it actually divided into two groups. Because in verse 4, talks about, uh, 
I heard a number of those that were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And so yeah, we have 144,000, which is the first group, uh, which is actually described from verse 4 all the way to verse 8. And we can see that literally it's referring to physical descendants of the tribes of Israel, except of the tribe of Daniel. So we can see that those that we got of Judah or Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, etc., but not the tribe of Dan. So we are talking about here yeah, a number of this first group of people that are sealed, which is a number which is defined as 144,000, saying who is able to stand? Well, 144,000 of the descendants of the tribes of Israel. And this number of, is the number of Israelites is presented together with a great multitude which no one could number of all nations. And that's in verse, uh, starting through verse uh, 9 uh, through 12. So, uh, yeah, it's the, a number of all nations. So we have a number of Israelites and a number of all nations. When it talks about nations, it actually means Gentiles. So the number of Israelites is 144,000 and the number of Gentiles, no one could number. Why is it no one could number? Because in verse 17, I is asking of chapter 6, who is able to stand? Why couldn't we number? Isn't God able to number them? Of course, if God wants, he's able to. But why does it say no one could number? Could it be because these Gentiles, which are free moral agents, and who knows, amongst them, some of mixed rate Gentile and Israelites, etc., are free moral agents. And when the tribulation happens, it's up to them to repent or not. And so, maybe God has not predetermined how many of those people are, because people are free moral agents and some may repent and others may not. And God is allowing those to repent, whatever number they will be, to be sealed. That could be very encouraging to a number of us because there are people that maybe we know that haven't repented, but during the Great Tribulation, God willing, they will repent. And God hasn't numbered them. He says no one could number them because if they do repent, they could be amongst that great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations. So these are physical people. They are physical persons. These 144,000, which come out of the Great Tribulation, as we see in verse 14. He said, these are the ones who come out of the Great Tribulation. So they are people that have been through the Tribulation, and during the Tribulation, they come out of it repentant. In other words, believing in Christ and repenting. And it says, and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That basically means they've been baptized. When we're baptized in Christ's name for the washing of our sins, for us to be forgiven. And once our sins are gone, we are white. White. How are our sins, how are our sins forgiven? By the blood of the Lamb. So they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, people during the tribulation repent, get to believe in God, get to trust in God, believe and, 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 
and commit that they're going to change, and they get baptized because a part of the church that has not gone, let's call it to the place of final training or of, uh, of safety, the other part of the church with leaders and ministers are now underground and those people will then have the magazines and the booklets and things that were published on the internet or if they don't have other people will talk amongst themselves you should have listened to this you should have repented and this will actually be the fruit of our work today that those people will repent and those members of the church that are in the or going through the tribulation and those leaders and those ministers because there will be some ministers too that that were not counted worthy to escape but they're still ministers they're still amongst those that keep the commandments of god and have the faith of jesus they will then baptize people and those people have their robes washed and made white in the blood of the lamb so this is people during the great tribulation that come out and they repent now if they have repented why should they be punished by god when god brings his wrath upon the earth obviously not so they're going to be protected so these people have access to god's throne like you and i have access to god's throne in a new and living way look at revelation 7 verse 15 uh, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will dwell amongst them now obviously there's a duality here, but understand that you and I today have access to God's throne in a new and living way that's what you and I read in Hebrews chapter 10 so let's go to hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 and 20. hebrews 10 is a very powerful section of scripture in fact the whole of hebrews is very powerful but in 19 and 20 or chapter 10 says therefore brethren it's talking to us today having boldness to enter the holiest what is the holiest it's god's throne by the blood of Jesus. It's talking to us, brethren, boldness to enter God's throne by the blood of Jesus. How? Because he's washed us and made us clean. And how? By a new and living way. Why? Why is it a new and living way? Because in the Old Testament, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and that was on the day of atonement once a year but now we have a new and living way that you and i can enter god's throne at any moment through uh, through the blood of christ or by the blood of christ as it says by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is christ's flesh he through his body he gave his body for us and through that we have access to God's throne now uh, continuing in Revelation chapter 9 verse 4 Revelation chapter 9 verse 4 as an example we see here in Revelation 9 verse 4 one one section of these seven trumpets it's actually the fifth trumpet so it's just one section but the eye says in revelation says that uh, they are commanded not to harm the grass or the earth or any green thing or any tree but only those men who do not have the seal of god on their foreheads so we are talking here at about a time period during that last year 
of the day of the Lord, during that last year of the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, in which physical human beings will not be harmed, and which physical human beings are those that will not be harmed? It's those that have the seal of God on their forehead. For it. Those people that are sealed by God, they will not be harmed by these, uh, let's call it punishments, of the seven trumpets. So we can see that they are protected during the day of the Lord. Uh, also, we discussed last week about Revelation 13, when we saw the beasts, civil and religious, influencing and convincing the merchants of international trade to the point that no one could buy or sell except he who has the mark. So yeah, we have a situation where people just cannot buy or sell, which means you can't buy food. It will be a time of hunger, a time of great difficulty. But in Revelation 7, in Revelation 7, which is talking about these people that are sealed, in verse uh, 16 and 17, it says, And these shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them, and lead them to living to the to living fountains of water. So these people that are sealed, and these are the Revelation 7, 144,000, which are physical human beings living, which are being protected during this last year. And even though there is this mark of the beast, they will be protected because it says they will neither anger anymore. So, yeah, they were hungry in the first two and a half years of the Great Tribulation. But on that last period where God is punishing the earth and the inhabitants on the earth, these people that have repented during the first part of the Great Tribulation will be sealed so that they will not hunger anymore or thirst anymore. Now, this is a very interesting quote, because neither shall they hunger anymore, nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any eat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. Did you know, did you know that this is a quote from Isaiah 49? verse 10. So let's look at Isaiah 49, verse 10. Isaiah 49, verse 10. Isaiah 49, verse 10 reads, They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun strike them, for he who has mercy on them, who is he that has mercy on them? It's the Lamb, right? Which is in the midst of the throne. He who has mercy on them will lead them. In other words, will shepherd them and lead them to living waters, fountains of waters. That was read in Revelation 7. It says, will lead them even by the springs of water. He will guide them. You can see that Revelation 16 and 17 is a quote from Isaiah 49 verse 10. Now, he has the interesting part. What is the context of Isaiah 49 verse 10? Do you know what? The context is the second Exodus. Look at verse 49 verse 12. Isaiah 49 verse 12. It says, surely these shall come from afar, from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinan. In other words, from afar, 
You can have other scriptures about the second exodus. There are many others. And they come from the north and the west, like northwest, British Isles, Europe. And, and these from the land of Sinan, uh, which is south, for instance, areas like Africa or even Australia. They come from all over the place. The context of Isaiah 49 is the second exodus. Therefore, these people that are sealed, that are physical, as we clearly showed, as we clearly show, they are physical human beings. They are protected during these um, uh, days of the seven trumpets, as we, we saw that. They protect them. We gave the example of Revelation 9 verse 4. We saw that they will not hunger or thirst anymore. Why? Because they're still physical and they're still little protected. The sun will not strike them. So they're physical. So it's talking about physical human beings. And it's in the context, right, of the second exodus. So these people then, when Christ comes back, will be the pioneers or amongst the pioneers, that will go to the promised land, the second exodus, to be the beginnings of the world tomorrow. So it is very interesting uh, when we start putting all the scriptures together. So with that as a background, now we're moving on to Revelation 14 which is a second group of 144,000. Now, the story flow of Revelation now picks up in Revelation 14 from Revelation 11, verse 15 through 19, because Revelation 11, verse 15 through 19 was part of the story flow, not an inset section. And now uh, in Revelation uh, 12, it was an inset about how Satan attacked the church. Revelation 13 was an inset about the leaders of these two uh, beasts, a civil and a religious. And now in Revelation 14, it goes back to the story um, because it continues from Revelation 11. So do you remember what Revelation 11 verse 15 was? Well, let's... Look at it very briefly. Revelation 11 verse 15 says, Then the seventh angel sounded. So Revelation 11 verse 15 is the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet is when Christ takes over. It's Christ's coming, his resurrection. It's when Christ takes over the kingdoms of this world. So Revelation 11 15 through 18 and 19 is basically the section about Christ's second coming. And so it's just kind of a, a beginning in, in that section of Revelation 11. And then it goes back to inset chapters until it gets back to chapter 14, when it continues again with the story flow. Now, we went through this section of Revelation 11, 15 through 19 before, but I just want to remind you that in verse 18, it highlights three major sets of events during Christ's coming. You see, in Revelation 18 it says, the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead, they should be judged. Point number one. Then point number two, it says, and that you should reward the saints and rewards your servants, the prophets, the saints, and, and those who fear your name. And point number three, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. So there are three major sets of events when Christ comes. Prima uh, first, the dead are judged. What do you mean by that? That means people are dead, 
Some are judged to be resurrected in the first resurrection, and some are judged to stay sleeping for another thousand years till after the millennia at the second resurrection. So the dead are judged. Secondly, the ones that are resurrected, they receive eternal life, but not only that, they receive a reward. They will be rewarded according to their works. So some people will be rewarded over 10 cities, over over five, over over two, and things like that. There's many parables about that. And thirdly, it says those that are there destroying the earth, they're going to be destroyed. So there are three major sets of events during Christ's coming. So this period of Christ's coming is a period of time, not very long, but a couple of days, because things can happen very quickly, as we'll see. We're not talking about months, but when Christ comes, there's a couple of days, a few days that things will happen, symbolized by what? The period between trumpets and atonement, because it's a couple of days, just a few days, symbolized by that, which is Christ's coming, and then atonement is at the end of this period of destruction, those who destroy the earth, which includes Satan is being put away. All right, let's now continue in Revelation 14, verse 1. And then I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Aha. A lamb, that's Christ, on Mount Zion. Where is Mount Zion? And they are standing with Christ. So to me, it shows it's people that are resurrected. Now remember in Revelation 7, I went through it very clearly to show they were physical human beings. Now, yeah, we are showing very clear they are standing resurrected with the Lamb in Mount Zion. They're resurrected. Christ is in the middle of them. They are counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Remember Luke 21 verse 36, pray and watch that you may be counted worthy to escape and to stand with the Son of Man. And here they are standing with the Son of Man. In other words, resurrected. And these 144,000, it says, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. Why? Because they belong to the Father. They, they have the Father's name. They belong to the Father. They redeemed from the earth, and they belong to the Father. In verse 2 and 3, then he says, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of hoppers playing their hops. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They are resurrected and they are redeemed, brought back. They are redeemed. Now, uh, there's a question. Will they have access to heaven? Well, if you're a spirit being, and if you travel at the speed of light, could they access to, uh, have access to heaven? Why not? Uh, you look at Genesis 28, verse 12, where Jacob had a dream, and there was this ladder, and angels were up and down the ladder from earth to heaven and back. Angels can go up and down to heaven and back to earth. We're in a rule on earth. But why can't we go and visit the Father? Look, even, even Satan is on earth, but he has access to heaven. He can go up and down. You look at that in Job when uh, God asked Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? And this in two situations in Job 1. And in Job 2. So these are spirit beings. We will rule resurrected. We will rule on earth. But 
if God calls us up and say, look, I want to have a chat with you, and why can't we go? You know, I think sometimes we, we say, well, because we're ruling on earth and living on earth, um, we can't go and visit a father who said we can't. The angels can. Aren't we going to be higher than the angels and spirit beings? So, the 144,000 were brought back, were redeemed from among men, right? Um, that we, we see that, yeah, let's see in, in verse 4. They are the ones who are not defiled with women. They are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever it goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits <coughs> to God and to the Lamb. Now, let me ask you another question. Does this include Gentiles? Of course it does. It's not just Israelites. You see, the 144 in Revelation 7 was only of 12 tribes of Israel, those 144. Plus, there was a great multitude of the other nations. This 144,000, these that are the first fruits, surely include Israelites and Gentiles. And also, surely include Samson. Because Samson, in Hebrews 11, verse 32, shows he was faithful, and Samson was of the tribe of Dan. Remember? And in Revelation 7, the first lot of 144,000, there were nobody of the tribe of Dan. But, yeah, we have spirit beings. Those that Hebrews 11 talks about the, the faithful, and Samson is included amongst that number, and he was of the tribe of Dan. So we are looking here in Revelation 14 at spirit beings after the resurrection, after they've been transformed into incorruptible beings. They are the first fruits, and they're definitely not physical beings. Because the physical beings were being protected from the Great Tribulation. This is now after, and this is the resurrection. They are the first fruits. Now in James chapter 1, it talks about us being a type of first fruits. Yes, we now are a type of first fruits, but we're not yet the first fruits. We will only be the first fruits if we qualify at the end and will be at the resurrection. At the moment, we're still a type of first fruits. Hopefully, we'll remain faithful till the end. For these various reasons, amongst others, these 144,000 of Revelation 14 cannot be the same as 144,000 of Revelation 7. Now, I know some people say they're the same, and they use some of the attributes of Revelation 7, also for Revelation 14 and mix the two. But when we look at the context carefully, we can see that they are two different groups. Now, if those who rule with Christ, now he has a big question, are really only 144,000. Think about that. If those who rule with Christ are really only 144,000, that number is very small since the time of righteous Abel. That is a small number, brethren. And, and in verse 5 of Revelation 14 says, says, And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. That's why you and I really need to be spiritually pure. That is, not to be contaminated with the love of this world or to give in to sin. We need to keep ourselves morally pure with no fault before God. 
And that's why we read in Luke 21 verse 36, watch and pray that you may be counted worthy. Are we counted worthy? These overcomers are the true followers of the Lamb because it says wherever the Lamb goes, they will be there. These are the ones that will marry Christ. These are the bride. And wherever Christ goes, they go with him. So that is quite significant. For us to say, how am I doing? Are we ready? Are we watching and praying that we may be counted worthy? Not only to escape, but to stand before the Son of Man. Now, Revelation 14 then continues with the three angel messages. So before the destruction of those who destroy the earth, we see a section here where winners and losers are identified in divine messages given by angels. The good news that judgment has come is now openly proclaimed around the world. Imagine Christ has come, this is, and things are starting to happen. Wow, imagine the excitement. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. There's no more hindrance. Now this is going to be preached. Christ is now coming. This is now going to be absolutely public. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Now is our judgment. Right, we know it's a judgment period, but those people that are destroying the earth, they're going to be destroyed. And worship him who has made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. All nations will receive the message of the everlasting gospel. The good news that God is about to deal with the world of justice and will now establish his sovereign rule over the world is going to go out fully. No stoppage. And let's read now verse 8. Another angel followed saying Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. That great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. So the imminent fall and destruction of Babylon the Great, which is what we're going to cover in Revelation 17 and 18, is due to occur now. In this short period, Christ comes, the dead are judged, there were some resurrect, some remain sleeping for another thousand years. The saints are resurrected, they're rewarded, and now is the destruction of those who destroy the earth. So this is now in a short period of time. All this is happening in a short capsule of time. A few days. <laughs> I beg your pardon. A few days. Now let's read verse 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them saying for loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, that's the smoke, of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So the losers of the war, the war which is for the spiritual control of humanity, are now identified. Those are the ones that don't worship God, but worship the beast. And said their judgment, which is long awaited by God's servants, will bring an end to God's wrath. That's why it says they'll drink the wine 
of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength. So that's these seven bowls of, uh, or, or the seven lost plagues that we're going to read in, in, uh, in uh, shortly, uh, not really today, but another day we're going to see that. And in the short period of time, that is going to be poured on these people. It's a judgment. And, uh, and before the holy angels and before the Lamb. And so, basically it says, now, here is the patience of the saints. That's in verse 12. Uh, Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faithful Jesus. And this is like a little message of encouragement to hold on. To hold on. Because there's going to be a judgment. And as we look at these things, Christ is going to come and there's going to be a judgment. And therefore, you and I have every reason to be confident of final victory. I know doubt come because I read the end of the book, right? As they say, well, we know doubt come. God has given us the outcome. Yes, we're going to go through difficult times. But he has a note of encouragement. All gone. All done. And then verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and the works follow them. We know that trials will continue. Satan will continue to use his instruments to deceive, persecute, and kill those who try to obey and serve God. But we also know that when people die at the end, yeah, it'll be just a short period of sleep. They are blessed because they're being protected from these, these evils to come. It's also a blessing. It's also a way of protecting. Let's now read verse uh, 14 through 16. Because, yeah, it reemphasizes that the saints will receive eternal life at this time. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud, and the cloud said, One like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thirst, threat, Thrust in your circle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so he sat on the cloud, thrusting the sickle to the earth, and the earth was reaped. Again, is a dual meaning, because it's now is the time when Christ is going to rule on earth, and he is going to bring uh, judgment, and he's going to teach his ways, and from your own words, uh, people are going to be reaped into the kingdom of God. So it's not just the ones that that were resurrected, but it's showing into the future, into the millennium, that the earth is now ripe and it's the time of the harvest of the earth. And verse 17 and 20, it also says, but the wicked and their iniqui iniquities will also be removed as a Farmer removes grain from a field with its sickle, and those of us are thrown into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So at this time, it's a time of the punishment of those that destroy the earth. And let's read then uh, verse 17 through 20. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him where the sharp sickle saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, and their grapes are fully ripe. And so the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs, which is for about 180 miles. The 
whole huge section full of blood of people that will be destroyed, that will be fighting against Christ and that in that area, it will be a huge area where there will be uh, a great destruction of men, of people there that are trying to fight Christ. And so that is the great wine press of the wrath of God. And that is nothing else but that the completion of God's wrath, which is completed by the seven lost plagues. And we read in 15 verse 1, Then I saw an, another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven lost plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. The wrath of God is complete. So these seven lost plagues are part of the third woe, and they are poured in full strength in the presence of the Lamb, as we saw early on. These plagues are comprised of several events, including the gathering of the kings of the whole world at Armageddon for the battle of the great day of Almighty God in Jerusalem. We will see that uh, later on, which is in Revelation 16, verse 12 through 16, that gather all the nations so that they fight Christ. And we read more about that in Zechariah 14, verse 1 to 4, that these nations will then fight Christ. We will read that in uh, future uh, lessons. But continue, yeah, in Revelation 15, verse 2 through 4. And then he says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on a sea of glass, having hops of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And this is great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. The seven of lost plagues, therefore, will complete the destruction of Satan's system in this world, or in other words, Babylon, and then all nations shall come and worship before God. And that we will study more in a future uh, uh, study. Thank you so much for your attention and have a good evening.